Welcome to Making It Last, where we share ideas to help families tackle major issues. I'm your host, Regina DeMeo, and with me today is Mitchell Batt, who's been helping people with employment issues for almost 20 years now. Thanks so much for being here, Mitch. Glad to be here. So let me ask you, what are some of the um, more common things that people come and, and you know, ask you about? Well, I'd say probably the number one reason people come to see me is they've been terminated from employment. I think that's the biggest issue. Um, the second issue that we see the most of is people with wage and hour problems. Either they haven't been paid, they haven't been paid overtime, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, and I'd say the third kind of big category of cases are harassment cases where they feel they're not being treated well at work. Like sexual harassment? Like sexual sure. harassment, and that's okay. typically what you're going to find in terms of when people have complaints, they feel that it's sexual harassment. Okay. So how would you prove something like that? Well, um, the proof of these cases are, are all very difficult. Um, and the reason is that, maybe kind of give you the big picture first, that Maryland, uh, as with most states, is what is known as the unemployment at will state. Okay. And uh, what that essentially means is that your employer can hire and fire and treat you pretty much any way that they want. There's a common misperception that if something is unfair, it must be illegal. Right. And uh, all too often I feel like I'm telling the young child that there's no Santa Claus because that's just not so. And the starting point in an employment law case is that your employer can do anything they want. And there are certain carved out exceptions that say you can do anything you want except you can't do A, B, and C. Right. And my job as an attorney, as all employment lawyers, is to determine whether or not the complaint that an individual has fits into one of those categories. And generally, in terms of termination issues, your employer can fire you for any reason they want unless it's for either a discriminatory or a retaliatory reason. Mm -hmm. So for example, if the employer says, you know, we're terminating you for poor performance, and you say, no, I don't believe that. I think the real reason you're terminating me is because I just turned 65, or you just found out I was pregnant, or one of those kinds of things. Okay then if you can prove that that's the reason that you were terminated, that would be unlawful. But if your employer terminated you because they said, hey, you know, you root for the New York Yankees and we don't like Yankees fans, um, that's not illegal. And the reason it's not illegal is there's no law that says it's illegal to fire somebody because of their baseball affiliation. So, What about the political affiliation? Like, let's say you work for Chick-fil-A, but actually you're in favor of gay marriages. I mean, is that... Something that they can no, actually... No, not in Maryland. It's not one of the carved out exceptions. So, so they could fire you they because could. they don't agree. They could. Wow. And, you know, contrary to, again, common belief, you have no constitutional rights in the workplace. The, if you work for the government, federal, state, or local, right. you have constitutional protection. But if you work for a private employer, as most people do, there is no constitutional protection. So they can say there's no free speech here. And they can do those things that a government couldn't do against you because a private employer is not required to follow the Constitution in terms of their employment relationship with you. So the important thing to recognize is that you have rights, but they're very limited in the workplace. And all too often, somebody will come in and see me, and they'll go through their story, and at the end of the day, the answer is, well, it sounds like you've been treated very unfairly, but unfortunately, there was nothing illegal. Wow. So what about something like severance packages? Are those, those, are those required or no? Those are just uh, unless your Unless your employer has promised that to you as part of your compensation package. So let's assume you're, you're hired into a job and they tell you that in addition to your benefits and your salary, we have a severance plan. They have to follow the terms of that severance plan if in fact you are terminated. But if they don't have a severance plan, and quite frankly, most employers do not, especially smaller employers, then they have no legal requirement to give wow. you severance. So they could bring you in and fire you for virtually any reason they want, unless it's uh, one of those exceptions to the rule. Right. And if they choose to offer you severance, they will. And if they don't choose to offer you severance, they won't. So there is no legal requirement that you be given severance if you're terminated. Wow, that's pretty harsh. <laughs> it is harsh. It is harsh. So, um, like with age discrimination, how, how would you um, know that there's a, a good case 
How okay. would you know if someone said to you, I think I'm being discriminated because of my age and they're trying to like get me to retire early. How do you know that that's a good case that is worth pursuing? Well, as you can imagine in this day and age, we rarely have direct evidence of discrimination. Okay. I, in 20 years of practice, I don't think I've ever seen an email that said, let's get rid of Hank because he's 63 years right. old. And my guess is if such an email existed, it they would never it. surface somehow yeah. in, in the discovery of the case. And the law recognizes that. So we know that discrimination occurs. That's a given, or we wouldn't have these laws in the first place. And we also know that we're rarely ever going to have direct evidence. So you have to look at circumstantial evidence to prove your case. And effectively, what you have to do is have evidence that, number one, creates some inference of discrimination. So for an example, let's say an, an individual comes in to me and they were terminated from employment. And they're 63. And they've been in the job for 20 years. And their boss comes to them. The reason that's given to them is, well, you know, we're letting you go because, um, you know, uh, your work just isn't up to par. Okay? Okay. And they terminate the employee. And now the employee comes in and tells me in the interview, you know, I worked there for 20 years. My performance reviews were all good. They never gave me any warnings. And then they came in out of the blue and told me that my performance isn't any good. And by the way, they replaced me with someone who's 46 years old. Well, or 36 years old, okay? Well, that, those facts would create an inference of discrimination, at, okay. at least at the start. Right. You know, you have an individual, and he seems to have been a long-term employee and doing well, and all of a sudden he's fired and replaced by somebody much younger. So once you've created an inference, the real fight then becomes whether the employer's reason makes sense. In other words, if the employer's reason for terminating you is poor performance, well, if in fact your performance is poor, and there's evidence to prove that, then it's likely no one's going to believe it's age discrimination. It just so happens you're 62, but you had poor performance. But what if the evidence would show that all your performance reviews were good, and you've never been issued a disciplinary action? And oh, by the way, you've got a peer who does the same work as you, who happens to be 20 years younger than you, and their work isn't any better than yours, and they're not terminated. Right. Well, now all of a sudden it sounds like the reason that the employer is giving is a pretext. Right. So if you can establish an inference of discrimination and then prove that the reason the employer is giving is a pretext, then a reasonable person might conclude they're lying to cover up the discrimination. So those are the types of facts we're looking for when we're evaluating whether we think it might be a plausible case of discrimination. OK, that makes sense. But I just want to be realistic. So while all of this is going on, right, this could, this could take a long time to prove. It could. And it could take a while before you get any sort of settlement if you send a demand letter and you go back and forth. So that at the same time, this person needs to go get a new job. Absolutely. Right? Like they, they can't just wait for you to like fix everything for them. That's correct. And, and in fact, you know, if you're, you know, one of the things you have to recognize about all of employment litigation is that um, the mere fact that an employer violates the law doesn't mean you get anything. It's uh -huh. like any other kind of civil litigation. You've got to prove damages. So simple example. Um, you get fired from a job, a job that you hated, by the way, right. but you get fired and you're making $55,000 a year and you walk out the door the next day and get a job at $65,000 a year that you really like. Well, there's no damages. There's no damage. You may have been you may have great evidence that you were terminated because of your age or your race or your sex, but the bottom line is you haven't suffered any damages. In fact, you're happy you're no longer there. Right. So there's no point in bringing a claim because effectively you'll win nothing. Right. So you have to have damages. So if in fact you are terminated and you're not so lucky to find a job right away, every day that you're out of work, you're suffering damages. Now, the law requires you, if you want to make a claim for those damages, to actively look for work. You can't just sit back and say, well, I'm going to use this as a, as a free ride for the next three years and try to win and claim three years of lost wages. You've got to be out there looking. So you have to mitigate your damages. You have to mitigate your damages. Okay. That's exactly right. And in fact, you would have to put on evidence in the case that you actively pursued work and that you made reasonable decisions about whether you to accept or not accept a given position. And if it were determined that you didn't actively look 
to mitigate your damages. The jury may very well find discrimination but not award you any lost wages. Wow. So you have to have both ends, right. and we evaluate both ends of a case um, to determine whether it's a case worth going after. Now, when, when you're doing all of this work, are you, are you doing it on a contingency fee basis? Like, if we win, I'll get a third or something like that? Or is it an hourly basis? Well, it depends on the case, and okay. it will depend upon the lawyers. Okay. Um, obviously, the, the stronger a case is, and the more the damages are in a case, the more attractive the case is to take on a contingency. I see. Um, conversely, the weaker the case is, and the less damages are at stake, the less likely it is. So there's no hard and fast rule, at least with me. I evaluate every case individually. Um, some cases will take on a contingency from day one. Some cases will start on an hourly and see how the case develops. Okay. So there's no specific rule, and as I say, there are lots of lawyers who practice employment law, and those can all be checked out. If you can't afford to, let's assume you came to me and I said, look, I just can't take your case on a contingency, and you're the individual thinking, I can't afford to pay hourly, especially when I'm out of work right now. Right. Um, then you want to look around and see whether you can find someone to take it on a contingency. Okay. I see. So it's not an unusual thing to offer in employment law cases to do it on a contingency but you have to find the right lawyer that's willing to do it for your case. So you have to make a very thorough assessment of whether you're going to be successful in this case. It doesn't mean that uh, they weren't wrongfully terminated, but can you actually succeed in proving this? That's exactly yeah. right, and, and there's no way that I can know yeah. um, what really happened. The only person who's really going to know why they fired you is the person who made the decision to fire you. Right. You know, we can't go in and do a brain scan or a lobotomy on that person to find out what they're thinking. You may want to. <laughs> we might want to, but we can't do it. So yeah. we have to look at the circumstantial evidence. So the most important thing if someone comes to see me, if they have a suspicion or a belief that I think I was terminated for an unlawful reason, is to marshal as much evidence as they can in terms of the things we've just talked about. So especially related to the reason that was given to the employee and then what their response is to that reason. Now, unfortunately, in a vast number of cases, the employer doesn't give you a reason. Right. They just tell you we're letting you go, and legally they don't have to give you oh, a reason. I was going to ask, but you don't have they to. They don't have reason. to. Um, and you're at that point, you know, the employee comes in, and all they can do is tell me, well, here's what went on, but I don't really know what they're going to say. And when that situation happens, if I'm interested in the case, at least at that point, I'll frequently write a letter to the attorney, or I'm sorry, to the company. Right. Usually the response will be from their attorney. Right. Basically saying, yeah, I'd like to know the reason that you terminated my client. Okay. Um, and generally you're going to get that. <clears throat> the employer usually isn't just going to deep six the letter. They're going to give you some response. And then at least it gives you th that starting point to then evaluate. The other thing is with discrimination cases, you can file your charge with one of the agencies. Like the EEOC. Right. So there are three agencies in Maryland that you could file your charge with because there's both federal, state, and local laws that oh. prohibit discrimination. And the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in Baltimore is one of the agencies. Okay. The Maryland Human Rights Commission in Baltimore administers the state law. And the Montgomery County Human Rights Commission administers the local law. And you can file charges with any one of those agencies. And hopefully an investigation will be done that at least at a minimum, the employer will be required to submit a position paper to give their explanation. So from that process, if you don't really know much at the start, once you get that information, it gives you more th information that you can bring to an attorney to evaluate the case. And you don't need to have an attorney help you file that charge. Sometimes okay. there are advantages to doing that, right. but it's not required, and the agencies are set up to handle people that don't have attorneys to file their charges. Great. We're going to take a short break, Okay. and then we will be right back. Everyone has friends. There's online friends, friends to go out with on a Saturday night. Friends to hang out with and do nothing. Friends who show up on moving day. And then there are the friends who'll be there if someone is dealing with a mental illness. Are you one of those friends?
Welcome back to Making It Last, where we share ideas to help families tackle major issues. I'm your host, Regina DeMeo, and with me today is Mitchell Batt. Um, and we've been talking about employment law issues. Thanks so much for being here, Mitch. It's been my pleasure. So I was telling you during the break that I've seen some pretty bizarre contracts lately. Like there's some employment contracts that my clients are getting. Uh, and they want me to review it, which is not something I do. Um, you know, and then there's these operating agreements that say if you're going to be a partner and have a stake in the business, you need a prenup to waive any interest, your, your spouse's interest in this business. Uh, so you do some of that too, right? We do. Um, frequently, individuals will come see me because they've signed employment agreements, which ironically don't really give the employee any rights no. because the agreement basically says we're going to do this, this, and this, but oh, by the way, you're at will so we can change it anytime we want. But on the other hand, they're binding you, the employee, to some kind of restrictive covenant, meaning that after you leave employment, you're going to be restricted in some way in terms of where you can work or what customers you can contact and that kind of thing. And oftentimes, people will come to see me at the point where they've now left the job and they want to get a new job, and lo and behold, they find out that this may be in violation of their non-compete. So it's a big issue right now. And all I can say, because we need a whole hour really to talk about the right. non-competes, but um, don't assume just because the non-compete says that you can't do something that you can't, because the courts don't like them. So there are lots of rules out there about what makes a non-compete enforceable. And there are lots of ways to attack a non-compete so that it's not enforceable. So that would be an area where it would probably behoove you to see an attorney um, if Preferably you're before you sign. <laughs> well, oftentimes you don't really have a choice before oh, you sign. You come in, you want the job, they slap it in front of you, and what are you going to say? No, I'm not going to sign it. Right. Usually it's after the fact. I mean, if you have the luxury of having it looked at ahead of time, that's to your advantage. But generally, certainly you want to have it looked at after the fact. Right. Don't just assume that you're not going to be able to do what you want to do because of the non-compete. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. The other thing we see frequently in terms of contracts are separation agreements. Even though we talked earlier that employers have no obligation to pay you severance, right? Um, the fact is oftentimes they do. And they do it for a number of reasons. There may be some employers that authentically are concerned about letting you go and want to help you bridge the gap and offer you a, a severance package. Okay. Um, and that occurs. And there are also employers that are giving you a severance package because they want to buy off any potential risk. Right, there's usually a waiver. You're not going to stake any claims against That's exactly them. right. And that becomes the big issue. So effectively in this agreement, what it's going to say is we're going to pay you six weeks of pay or three months of pay or whatever it might be. And in exchange, you're going to agree to never sue us. And um, the important thing about that agreement is they're generally enforceable. So if you sign it and then find out three months later that in fact they did terminate you for an unlawful reason because you get an email from a friend who works there and says, oh, by the way, I heard this and it's too late. You know, uh -huh. with very few exceptions, you've given up your rights. So uh -huh. the caution there for you is if you get a separation agreement that has a release, which it invariably will, right. The important thing to really have reviewed is whether you're giving up any legal rights that you might not know about. So that may be worth the time spent with an attorney for an hour to go through that and at least get a sense that there's not something out there that you might be giving up. Because if there is a potential claim, then that can serve as leverage to try to negotiate a better severance deal. Okay, now that makes sense. We had also talked about what I know sounds like very few rights for the employee. And, yeah. and your rights really are limited. There are some benefits you do have, and one of them, since we've been talking about termination, is unemployment compensation, okay. which is a benefit offered through the state. And all the rules that I've talked about earlier about that the employer can fire you for pretty much any reason they want, those don't apply to your rights for unemployment. If you're terminated from employment, unless the employer can show that you were fired for either misconduct or gross misconduct, then you're going to be entitled to your unemployment benefits. Okay. So it doesn't mean that you can sue the employer for wrongful discharge simply because they didn't fire you for misconduct or gross misconduct, but it could entitle you to your unemployment benefits. So by all means, uh, you want to file unemployment claims uh, if in fact you are terminated. 
And there are circumstances where if you quit, you can also be eligible for unemployment if you've quit under good circumstances, good cause or valid circumstances. So an example, you know, you, you've been sexually harassed by your employer um, and you're afraid to go forward and make a claim, but you can't stay in the environment anymore, so you quit the job. That would be grounds to say I quit for good cause and therefore be entitled to unemployment benefits. And there's a, a host of reasons why you could be found to have quit for good cause or valid circumstances that would entitle you to unemployment benefits. What are some of the signs that there is actually sexual harassment going on, just so that employees are aware of what to look for? Yeah, there's no, there's no magic formula. Okay. Again, it's a constellation of facts. Um, but what the courts are looking at is what we call a hostile work environment. That's effectively the sexual harassment cases that we see. And um, let me kind of start with, again, back to a, a misconception. There is no general law that prohibits a hostile work environment in the state of Maryland, meaning I could be the most hostile individual in the world and scream and yell and swear and throw paper clips at you. But if I'm not doing that for a discriminatory reason, because of your race, sex, age, national origin, that kind of thing, it's simply not illegal. There's no code of civility mandated by the state. Okay. And the logic would be that most companies don't want to operate that way and they'll deal with that in-house. But the fact that you may work for a particular company that doesn't care puts you in a situation where if you don't like it, find another job. But there's no legal claim. And all too often I get calls of I've been subjected to a hostile work environment. And it may be hostile, but it's not a discriminatory hostile work environment and therefore it's not unlawful. So the reason sexual harassment is the most common form of hostile work environment that we see is that the behavior is generally self-proving of the motivation. If you as a female, for example, come in and say I'm being sexually harassed by my boss who's male, and he says inappropriate things to me, and he's asked me out, and he wants to have a relationship with me, and he touches me inappropriately, likely he wouldn't be doing that if you weren't a female. <laughs> right. And therefore, his behavior proves or self-proves that his motivation is because you're a female, right. which raises the interesting legal question of, well, what if he's bisexual and does it to both men and women evenly. Right. Be questionable whether that in fact is actionable sexual harassment since he's not treating you any differently because of your gender. Oh my God. But assuming that in a sexual harassment case it, it is one of the situations where it's clear that the behavior seems to be focused on you because of your gender, then you have to look at the totality of the circumstances. How frequently does it occur? Is there physical touching versus just verbal comments? What's the position level of the individual who's doing it? So the higher up in the food chain, the more it would be viewed as being a hostile work environment right. because you feel you have less control over the situation. Right. So again, those are the types of things that we look at. Have you witnessed the same individual doing it to others? Have you made any complaints about it that have gone unanswered or uninvestigated? So it's that whole totality of circumstances that determine whether or not the harassment that you're suffering rises to the level of being legally actionable and then of course what is the motivation for it which is what makes non-sexual harassment cases so difficult to right. prove. I may in fact for example let's assume I use poor language and I'm rude to <laughs> you heard all of that. <laughs> on a regular basis. Yep. Well but nothing that I've done specifically is gender related. Right. It's gender neutral. Right. If you could show that there are three women in the office and he treats us all the same way and there are three men in the office who he takes out to lunch, then you might still be able to prove a hostile work environment based on gender right. even though there's no sexual component to mm -hmm. it. But generally the evidence doesn't come out that clear. So again, we're back to if he treats everybody badly, he's an equal opportunity harasser, if you will, which is just simply not actionable. So when somebody leaves or gets terminated, I'm, I don't really understand. Uh, COBRA is, is something that I think not all employers have to do. It depends on the number of employees they have. Right. Is that right? 20 is the threshold. So okay. if your employer is more than 20, you're entitled to COBRA. 
And the good news about COBRA is it gives you an automatic right to continued insurance, the same group insurance that you've had while you've been with your employer, for but you, your spouse, whatever. At a very expensive but rate. But at a very expensive rate. Because in effect, you're paying now the entire amount of the coverage, whereas before that, likely your employer was contributing either all or some large amount towards the premium. Okay. So that's what makes COBRA prohibitive in that it's very costly. Um, but at least it's guaranteed coverage, and it's guaranteed for at least 18 months, so that you're not going to be without coverage if you don't, if you, if you need it, and you can't find it. In, it. in other words, it really serves to bridge the gap until you can find the next job. But what about for an uh, employee that was working for somebody with less than 20 people? Then they won't have COBRA. They won't. Mm -hmm. Maryland has a continuation program under Maryland law that could allow you to continue coverage. The rules are slightly different, and okay. it's for a lesser period of time. But there is a continuation program under Maryland law that your employer should have to follow. And if they don't know about it, which many employers don't, you should advise them of it or you could contact an attorney or contact the Maryland Insurance Commission to get the information that you would need to be able to, to continue your coverage for some limited period of time. Okay. What about like sick leave and vacation? You know, I, 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 we have the sense of entitlement, I think, right? But the fact is, uh, I, from what you're saying, we really may not have rights to like uh, two weeks of vacation and one week of sick leave. Is, is, is there a minimum that you have to be no, given? No, okay. the, the rules on benefits is that your employer can offer you whatever they want or nothing. Okay? Okay. So they don't have to offer you anything. There's no right to have any benefits. Um, many employers offer benefits because people expect them and they want to be competitive in recruiting and retaining people. Right. But once they offer them, then they do have an obligation to pay them based upon what you've earned. So what that effectively means is that your employer, number one, doesn't have to have the program if they don't want it. Right. And number two, once they have it, they can change it any time they want. But for whatever you have earned while it's in existence, you have a legal entitlement too. So for example, if you accrue you know, uh, uh, a day a month for vacation or paid right. time off, um, the employer can have rules about when you can take it, but you're entitled to it. And if you're terminated from employment or leave employment, unless the employer has a written specific policy that says you don't get it at time of termination, then you're legally entitled to that. Okay. Okay? That's yours. Now, that's not true of sick leave because sick leave is a benefit that you may ne never need. Right. So it's really just vacation and PTO that you have a right for at your time of termination unless the employer has a policy that says you don't get it. Wow. Okay. And that's true with wages as well. Your employer can't hold your wages hostage. Once right. you've earned it, you are entitled to it no matter what happens. Okay. Okay. Well, this has been great. If somebody wanted to contact you for further information, how would they do that? Sure. Um, they could contact me, first of all, by phone. And the number is 301-340-2450, extension 13. My email is mbatt, that's M-B-A-T-T, -T, at verizon.net. You can get more information about me uh, on lawyers.com, um, which is a very global website where you could punch in my name and it'll have a biography and so forth of, of what I do. Great. Thanks so much, Mitch. You're quite welcome. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next week on Making It Last. <laughs>